just to say though, that today's talk is just about my experience and not any commentary on the projects, how they work, what they do and, or, and so on. So yeah, the first part of our story tonight is about the Pelican watch. There we go. And um, the, the background to this little story is that the Cape Cormorant is under pressure for multiple reasons. And one of the reasons is that pelicans have started to predate on the cormorant wrist or uh, breeding, breeding sites. And one in particular being, being Jutton Island. And the reason that these guys are, have sort of changed their, their behavior is sort of somewhere around 2005, um, many pelicans started eating pig offal at a local piggery. Um, somewhere off the Western Cape coast. And um, they also, according to the story, started eating dead chicks from hatcheries in the area. And of course, this is highly nutritious food. It's easy to get, the guys don't have to go fishing and their population exploded and they were having a fantastic time. And then the local health authorities stepped in. And overnight, their food source was taken away. And the sad reality for the pelicans was that many of them died because in their food source was no, nothing to eat anymore. Um, a number of the babies had not been taught how to fish. They'd been taught how to eat pig offal. And uh, so there was quite a high mortality rate. And one of the adaptations post this is that the pelicans learned how to eat cormorant babies. And so the, the first protagonist of our story tonight is the great white pelican. Um, but perhaps let me just put a bit of context into where this whole story takes place. And it, it's in an island called Jutton Island, which is about 100, 150 k's north of, of Cape Town. Um, it's located just outside the Saldana Bay, which is where Langebaan is, uh, also where the Sishan um, iron ore um, manufacturing is, or, or sort of the, the, you know, where they work with the ore. And you'll see it right at the bottom of there of the picture there of the map is Jutton Island. It's about a half an hour drive by boat to, to get there. And you know, you can sort of just get a sense of the island and what it looks like and just be aware quickly and to see the, the walls that have been built onto the island. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how and where that, that comes from. Um, to get to the island, the local sand parks guys would pick us up in a boat. And typically what happens is the, the Pelican Watch actually runs for, for three months from November to the end of January. And every week, a new bunch of volunteers, four or five people in the team, get picked up, get taken to the, uh, to the island, and the next, the, the guys that were there previously get brought home. Um, so we load all our stuff onto the front of the, of the, of the boat, wrap it up in a tarpaulin, and, and head out. The, you know, in as much as that you're so excited to be going out to the island, I've heard so much about it. Part of the journey out was just a little bit sad, however, because we passed what would have been the old whaling site from, you know, all those years ago. And the thought of, you know, all of these whales being killed and, you know, used for their oil and their blubber and so on. Just, you know, harsh reality of what this area would have looked like. The other part of it was, of course, what happened to this area of Langebaan when the whaling plug was pulled. And in this instance, the guano farming was, was pulled. And in actual fact, it's quite, it's a bit of a giggle because it's almost like the residents of Langebaan were a bit like the great white pelicans. They went through a bit, a bit of a tough time when their food source sort of dried up almost overnight. Uh, so I thought it was quite a cool sort of parallel between you know, what was happening in this area. Um, but that, that melancholy, that sadness was soon forgotten as we headed out of the bay and the island of Jutton started to loom in front of us. And, um, you know, this, this, this coastline that is quite barren actually with the building sort of becoming bigger and bigger, looking a little bit derelict. Uh, this pier on the left-hand side that is completely... Um, you know, it's, it doesn't work anymore. It's a relic of the past. Um, just really spoke about such an adventure coming up. So 
We arrived at the island, uh, which was quite cool, is this pier was actually built by the honorary rangers for the purposes of the Pelican Watch. Um, so one of the projects that the, that the rangers have made possible. Um, grabbed all our stuff, headed up the stairs, and went into what was going to be our home for the next week. And this, these buildings are the buildings that were used by the guano farmers, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, from almost 100 years ago, like probably close to about 90 or so years. And um, so the building right in front of us on the right-hand side is actually the barracks or where the, the farmers would have lived in. Our building was just at the back, but perhaps for me, the iconic building on the island is, little, is this little house where I would imagine that the managers would have lived in, the more sort of senior people. And for quite a few mornings of the, <clears throat> of the strip on the island, actually spent a couple of, an hour or so just sitting on the steps, watching the sunrise, listening to the seagulls. And it was just, it was spectacular. And Part of the reflection was how amazing that this little building has witnessed something in the vicinity of about 55 and a half thousand sunrises. <laughs> and so in my head, this was the house of the rising sun. And even though it's not from New Orleans, I thought the animals would be proud. <laughs> um, for those of you who get the joke. So yeah, just beautiful. And the inside of the building, it's a bit derelict at the moment. And, and you know, there's certainly talk of making it into a more sustainable project for tourism to try and you know, generate income, but hopefully that'll manifest in the future sometime. Our building, um, very basic, but I absolutely loved that very minimalist lifestyle. Uh, this was my room um, at night, although there was a solar panel with lights, I actually spent most of my time with a candle and uh, just reading, catching up. We had ex excellent Wi-Fi on the island. Um, the, the kitchen was uh, well, well, um, all, all, all the amenities we needed with a gas stove and a gas fridge and hot water. And yeah, it just, uh, it's fantastic. Such a, such a wonderful experience to be in this minimalist space. But at the same time, everything you need is there. Compared, of course, to where the Guano farmers would have lived 90 odd years ago. 30, 40 people in a room, you know, just on that bunk alone, um, probably 12, 9, 12 guys uh, bunking, the dining room right next to their, to their bunks, no electricity, of course, uh, no toilet facilities, um, water in an aqueduct that would have been collected in the rain, food that would have had to be brought in. You would imagine these guys would live eating very basic food. And uh, there's rabbits on the island, which were, you know, the stories that they were brought that brought onto the island that is a food source. Um, yeah, tough, 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 tough living. Um, so just to give you a sort of sense of the compound as a whole, this is the view from the highest point of, of the island. Uh, just out of interest, the, these two little hills can be seen just peeking out. Um, against the headland from, from Langebaan Beach itself. And I wonder you know, how many people in Langebaan have actually thought about these islands and have actually had the opportunity of being on the island. So such a, for me, it's such a privilege to have been there. But just to give you a sense of what the island looks like uh, as a whole, um, yeah, check it out. So this is facing north and the second hill just in front of us, uh, obviously the, the compound there. Uh, Langebaan, it's in the background. Um, you can get a sense of how close the, the, the mainland is. Really. This is actually more of a, a, a bit area that was jutting out. Um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see an amphitheater that was built at some point, probably to protect the guys from the wind. This part of the island is where most of the gannet, uh, sorry, the, the, the cormorants roosted at night. And um, as you can imagine, incredible sunsets. And there you go. That is it. That was our home for a week. About a, a, a sort of a one square kilometer in size, 44 hectares about. And um, yeah, you know, if you're in a rush, you could make it around the island in a half an hour. Uh, if you take a bit more time going into the rocks and so on, maybe 45 minutes to an hour to do a full, a full circuit of the island. And I just loved it. I 
just absolutely loved being on this island. It was an incredible opportunity. Um, but just before we go on, I need to pay homage to, to Graham, who's on the, on the call tonight, Graham Down. And he is my captain who made this adventure real. He made, made the opportunity real. He's also the guy who made the uh, Kruger Trails real. Um, and just anybody on the call or anybody here that is interested in walking 100, 200 k's to the Kruger Park this year, we are walking um, leg three and leg four of the hike, and we would love to love to have you on the hike. So, an astonishing adventure that is coming up pretty pretty soon. Anybody who's interested, just give me a give me a shout. So, what is all the ruckus about? Well, the ruckus is about this little guy, the Cape Cormorant, and um, Jutland Island is one of the primary breeding sites for this little bird. The talk is that in the past could have had 100, 200,000 birds living on this island at any point in time. In fact, you know, you think back 10, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe three, 400,000 birds, you know, um, quite, quite astonishing. Um, we didn't see too many, probably only about 5,000 birds or so. And most of those birds were, were juvenile. Also, although the main uh, colony is made up of the Cape Cormorant, there are other cormorants. The, the sad reality of what is happening to so many of these breeding sites and so many of these populations is this is the crown cormorant. Um, probably 30 or so birds that were on the island the year previous. This year, we only saw four. And they weren't nesting, they'd literally come in and we expect them to leave. Um, so guys, this, this experience of what we're seeing is real. Uh, these birds are under threat. And it was just wonderful to know that what we're doing has the vision of trying to maintain the sustainability of these, of these sites. So as I said, probably five or so thousand birds on the island uh, and most of them juveniles you can see these guys here a little bit gray they lack that orange yellow uh, bib under under their bill um what we were hoping to see was this hundreds if not thousands of birds all nesting um contributing to the sustainability of the of, of this population what we actually saw was this and you know, a couple of guys here in the room shaking their heads. What was quite cool is that we had actually missed the breeding cycle. They, for some reason, the birds had bred earlier this year. Um, and from what I've heard from what an actually an SM member, hopefully she's on the line, is that they have started breeding again as we speak. So this is this is great news. So there's a there's a second cycle um, happening. So that's great news. Um, so. Even though there weren't that many, well, there weren't any breeding birds on the, on the island, the pelicans were still coming in almost on a daily basis, sometimes two, three times a day, just coming to check out what was happening. And that was quite cool. You know, as soon as one of us saw them, this pandemonium, because there was the excitement of the pelican is now here. We, our job has meaning. <clears throat> And um, we all, you know, carrying radios or we're all, you know, sitting in the kitchen or whatever the case may be. And the, the call would go out, the pelicans are here. And it would be the scramble to get to wherever the pelicans were heading so that they knew they were not welcome and would be shooed, <laughs> shooed, <laughs> shooed off the island. So, um, but, you know, they weren't that interested when we were there. But Graham, you know, tells the story of when the, when the chicks are there, they are then they're pretty smart and so they see the guy coming to chase them off and they'll just fly 50 meters down to the next part of the beach and then the the oak will have to go run run to this side and they'll fly to the island they'll fly to the other side of the island and they watch they know and um <laughs> so it's quite a yeah, it's 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 quite a thing um and i'm not sure that the cycle is going to be broken for for many many years and you know the sad the, 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 the nice reality is that we are being proactive to maintain the sustainability of this colony. 
And to give you an idea of how severe it is, you can see the pelicans there in the background and just below them is the cormorants. The cormorants are a fraction of the size of these, of these pelican birds. And the story is, you know, as many as 100 to 200 chicks a day can be predated on by these, by these pelicans. And you work that out over three months, it's a lot of birds being eaten. In fact, this, once again, the story is that there has been years in the past where an entire breeding cycle has been decimated. So guys, this is such an honor to have been part of this project and um, to, to help maintain the sustainability of these birds on our coastline. Um, the, the other thing that was sad, I guess, never mind the whaling and the history of the whaling, was although you know, the birds weren't breeding uh, and they're facing um, you know, food, food security issues and so on, they're also being hammered by avian flu at the moment. And um, we were the second cycle on this year's uh, Pelican Watch. And one of the things that we were asked to do is to go and pick up the carcasses of dead cormorant birds. And it was, it was pretty hectic. The, the first group of people that were on the island probably cleared just over a thousand birds. Our team cleared 996 birds. And geez, guys, you know, there were some of the birds we picked up, they were more of a soup than a bird. The smell, you can imagine, um, burning the birds was intense. But the hope, once again, is that by being proactive and being a part of this project, that we are limiting the impact of the flu on the birds, especially considering that many of the birds, the dead birds were actually in amongst the nesting sites or even on the nests themselves. And so um, by clearing the dead birds out, you know, hopefully, hopefully one day we'll look back and say, yeah, it, it was worth it. Um, so what we did was in the mornings, we'd walk around with buckets, Clearing, clearing birds, collecting the carcasses, putting them together, and then doing a burn. The next day, we would move the bin to another part of the island and repeat and repeat the process. Um, and quite a thing to to burn to burn that many birds, you know, uh, petrol, and you've got to stick a piece of wood into the into the bin and move the birds around so that the the fire, you know, is able to to get enough air. Quite a quite a thing. So the cormorants are facing lack of food. They're facing the reality of the pelicans. They're facing the reality of avian flu. They're also facing the reality of kelp gulls. Our estimate was that there's probably two, maybe 3,000 kelp gulls on the island. And um, they had quite a bad rip. Uh, uh, certainly, on, you, you, you get attacked all the time. I thought they were incredible beings. Just their power in flight and how astonishingly, how astonishing they were. Uh, it, it, it was just joyful to, to watch these guys flying around. And the key, though, well, the thing that sort of the, one of the reasons why they have such a bad rep is they constantly attack. And so you'll see this is sort of a traditional uh, um, walking around wear and we're wearing like a backpack with a stick coming out the back of our heads. And that stick sticks about a hundred, about a, a meter or so high. And the reason we do this is because the kelp gulls attack the highest part of your body, <laughs> which happens to be the stick. Um, in this instance, I don't have my hat. But you have to wear a hat, a padded hat, preferably, because sometimes the birds don't mind the stick and they actually body strike. And there's been a couple of guys that have been sent home in the past having to get stitches as a result of the attack from, from these birds. And um, you'll see the radio uh, on my, on my, on my um, backpack just in case the pelicans come and we can react quickly. And binoculars and a smile, of course, because just in a place like this, how else 
but to be just so so happy but you know these these, these girls one of the reasons i was so infatuated with them is because they were being amazing parents and there were literally hundreds of these kelp gull babies living in amongst the, the fechis um, on the island. And these birds were simply doing what they needed to do as parents. So I think, wow, amazing. And just a quick one, on the, on the fechis, there were thousands of these flowers when we were there. In fact, we actually did this little exercise where we counted out these little sort of 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter blocks and we counted the flowers in these blocks and then using very scientific methodology, we extrapolated outwards. Um, and our estimate was that there was something between 19 and 25 million flowers <laughs> on the island. <laughs> I mean, that's astonishing, right? Um, Fauna, flora, and of course, uh, the beasties. And we're going to be talking about the beasties just in a couple of minutes, a bit more, but uh, the seals are, are around and there's just north of the island, a rock that the seals live on. And it's almost like there's a truce where they kind of stick on that little, on that little rock. And if they come onto the main island, we were asked to chase them off because they also predate um, on, the, on the birds. So these cormorants are having a tough time. <laughs> a, couple of, a whole bunch of people and animals and whatever else that are taking them out. This little guy still had his umbilical cord attached. And, you know, when I came past, um, he just was like curious. I couldn't resist taking a picture. Um, the, the, the sadness again, you know, this, this sort of juxtaposition of being on the island of so much joy, but also so much sadness was a couple of the, 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 the seals that came onto the island and were just a bag of bones. And obviously showing, you know, how, how tough it is and how this boot source is, is down. Lots of birds, this little guy, a rock kestrel living right next to our home, feeding five chicks. The oyster catchers are, their population is exploding on the island. We think part of the reason is that the black mussels are coming back again, which is great. We counted over 400 oyster catchers on this island. Just amazing to see them. But I think I have to say, notwithstanding the cormorants, my favorite birds on the island were this little family of Egyptians. Now, I used to live next to the Western Dam, you know, comparing the Western Dam to Jutton Island, very different. And I just couldn't really figure out whether these geese were simply suicidal or whether they just got a fat jaw out of surfing. So check this out. <laughs> these, these geese line themselves up against that rock time and time and time again. And then a couple of them would like allow themselves to get washed out and just check them coming in now, freaking body surfing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah many many hours just uh, catching up on some reading some chill time and watching the egyptian geese doing their doing their surfing um so obviously guys and i don't like this there's tons of history and one of the things that was really cool was seeing these little discs that had been sort of concreted onto the rocks and the history of these discs goes back to the guano farmers from, you know, obviously 90 odd years ago. And the number represented the piece of land that these guys would then mine for, for guano. And just as a, you know, what I thought was quite a cool little fact, if you think about two or 300,000 cormorants that are each pooping two or three times a day, that is like half a million poops a day on a pretty small space. And, um, you know, a meter or to two meters of guana building up on an annual basis was then removed um, back in the day when it was a valuable commodity. Um, to the point where it was such a valuable commodity that the guys in the past actually built these walls. And my understanding is that the walls were built to stop seals and other 
predators coming in to disturb the, the, the birds as they were breeding, which would then ensure the sustainability. So really early example of a great conservation. Um, the other thing which is really cool about these walls is that they were built using uh, mussel shells that were burnt in kilns that then made like a lime cement that was used to um, yeah to make the make the walls with the, the local rocks and stuff on the island, and so using the walls as a as a sort of highway walking through the uh, um, walking through the island was fantastic. Like we needed to move fast, we could, um, but also I had a giggle because the thought of these guys, the guano farmers, let's say ninety years ago being bombed by seagulls and being shat on is a reflection of the fact that these seagulls have learned over a hundred years to perform or perfect the art of shitting. Mm -hmm. To the point where these oaks now understand vectors, speed, distance, excretion power, and they are deadly accurate. On any day on the island that you would he pooped on is a guarantee. The only question is how many times would you get pooped on in a particular on any particular day? And you're sort of like this and this warm feeling dripping down. <laughs> so yeah, a hundred years of pooping lessons. Uh, quite a quite a thing. So just to sort of start finishing up the, the story on this island, um on the biggest rock on the top of the hill, there's this fascinating mural. And as much as we've sort of been trying to understand what the mural represents, so far I haven't figured it out yet, but apparently drawn by two guys that had got left there, forgotten, and their food had run out and what have you. And we don't know whether they actually got rescued or not, I'm not too sure, but their legacy prevails all these years later. Um, kind of a weird, a weird picture to find in the middle of nowhere. Um, the other picture on the island that just really caught my imagination was this picture of what would have been on a, a, a clipper ship or a sail ship from all those years ago. And I find it so evocative to sit behind that rock, look at that picture that had been drawn how many years ago by some guy and imagine what the bay would have looked like filled with these old sail ships and potentially whaling ships and uh, um, Wow, like a, just a, an entire different era. So, so, yeah, so really evocative to think about that, the different worlds that we were living in. And what would a deserted island be without a gravesite? <laughs> <laughs> so some guy has his soul, or maybe many, uh, um, on this island as, as their home. So guys, that is Jutton Island. And yeah, for me, just such an incredible experience. Across the other side of the bay is Malchas Island. And Malchas Island is the home of the Gannet colony. Thousands and thousands of these birds. And just got to say, once again, I'm so grateful to, 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 for the opportunity of being there because we were able to go there for about 10, 15 minutes as part of a, um, like a rescue that the sandbox did to go and pick up one of the birds that had been injured and was being sent back to the mainland to be um, fixed. I can't remember what was wrong with it. And so I had this window of time. It feels like a lifetime, even though it was just such a small window of being able to stand right next to this population. As we got on the island, we got sprayed down with muti to make sure all of the chokas were off us and whatever. And, the, the, like, wow, just a privilege. And um, on the island are, we met two of the guys there, one of the ladies, Zanri, and her uh, partner, Tian, who are both completing their PhDs. And the PhDs are on, on the Gannet itself. So just to give you, you know, just a little bit of background, um, these guys are endangered. Um, they predate on fish in the area. Uh, obviously facing real issues with food security. So the research is really important. And what the guys are doing is they are taping GPS devices 
onto the backs of these birds and then retrieving the GPS when they come back to the island. And um, some of the things that, oh, sorry, some of the things that is quite astonishing is that these guys are flying up to 500 kilometers per fishing trip, taking as, taking as much as 27 hours to get back to their babies. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot that will <laughs> come out as to why that is and you know what some of the, 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 the factors are. But the other thing that really, never mind just the knowledge, but what really excited me was the fact that this tracking data can help to determine the possibility of a, um, of a marine protected area. So um, guys, one day, hopefully we'll look back and we'll say this protected area is in part or largely due to, to Tian and Zandri and the, and, the works, and the work that they are doing. And so just at this juncture, if there is anybody here or in the audience that would like to support a project like this, uh, reach out to me. I know the guys need the cash. Uh, it's very, very important. And uh, yeah, if you are interested, give me a shout. For the Essa Oaks, I thought it would be really cool to have an Essa Gannett flying around with the GPS on his back called Essa. <laughs> so Oaks, maybe as the committee, we need to uh, have this chat and see, <laughs> see if this is possible or not. Piers? <laughs> 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 yeah. So guys, that was my experience on on Jackie. I can't wait to go back. But also wanted to give a different perspective and talk about the beasts for a little bit. Um, the second trip this year or last year that was aimed at making a massive difference was volunteering as part of a snare hunt in the Kruger National Park over the long weekend in December. This is also an honorary ranger initiative. And really guys, these, this, this, uh, the, S, well, the HR are doing incredible work. Once again, if anybody's interested in volunteering to be part of the organization, reach out and I'll introduce you to a couple of people. Um, but there are two heroes in the story. And the first hero is a guy called Jacques, hopefully he's online, and Mandy, who I saw earlier, so hopefully she's still online. And these are the two guys that are selflessly every single month heading out into the bush and they are clearing snares every month. These guys have saved the lives of hundreds, possibly even thousands of animals. Like, wow. And I got to tell you, it was like, I get tearful. Like it was an honor to be working with these oaks in the field. The weekend that we were there, um, we were based at the canine anti-poaching unit, which is um, just next to the Pabeni gate. And over that weekend, the, the team of volunteers removed in the vicinity of 300 snares from the bush, four days of which one was rained out. Like, wow. So the role that guys are playing to support sand parks is massively powerful. Um, the snares themselves are, well, the, certainly the ones that we found were primarily aimed at catching um, impala and buffalo. Yeah, buffalo, can you believe it? Um, and you can imagine that sort of either hanging below a branch of a tree or on the side of a tree, the circumference probably of about a probably about a meter or so, um, and you can imagine these guys just walk straight through, and then obviously get get caught. But obviously uh, the guys are catching other other stuff as well. Uh, you can see there on the right, um, trying to look at um, warthog probably. But you know the guys are also looking for carnivores. And so it's about bush meat and it's about mooty. So how the guys catch the carnivores is they typically will kill a, a, a dog or something similar, and they will use that as bait in a, um, a hide that is set up. And um, yeah, the, 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 the snare in the middle, obviously quite a thick wire, 
couple of the ones that we found the weekend when I was there um, were blow dart. Many of us will know what a blow dart is. Four strands wrapped together around the base of the tree and three strands wrapped together that would ultimately um, be used for the, to, to, you know, to make sure the animal doesn't snap the wire. Um, incredibly, incredibly sad. So just to give you a sense, I don't know if you guys can see um, in the picture, the snare itself. Um, in the picture is Jacques, I gotta say a hero. I only just met him, but I will remember this guy forever. Like, wow. And of course, Monday coming up in this picture. And, and not only are the guys clearing snares, they're also clearing alien vegetation. So at the beginning of the year, they were out um, and they cleared six and a half thousand lantana bushes from an area. Like, wow, just a group of 10 or so, so volunteers. So super dedicated people. And just before we move on to the next slide, I need to say, anybody in the audience or anybody watching that a little bit squeamish, this is the time to close your eyes. Okay. This is the reality of what is, what is happening. Um, the guys tell the story of an Impala U that gave birth in the snare. Um, hunting uh, buffalo is real. One of the stories is the guys actually were cutting the buffalo up while it was still dying to you know, expedite the process. The damage is severe. Can you imagine the last hours of this animal's life? This is wow, guys, this is real. Um, so a story that started off pretty badly, but actually ended up quite well. It's a story that's um, all over Facebook at the moment. If anybody's interested, Google, wild dog snares and you'll typically find it on Facebook was this little guy who was caught with a, a snare around his neck and around his leg. And the local conservation guys um, found him, set up an impromptu surgery in the middle of the felt, got the snare out, patched him up, antibiotic, gentian violet, and um, the, the, the story on Facebook, if you guys do go and check it out, is that they then used the radio signal to find out where the rest of the, um, the pride was. Pride is it pride of wild dogs? Um, pack, pack of wild dogs. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was actually quite close by. They used uh, the sounds of the, of the, 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 the dogs make to bring the pack in. And this little guy um, was then injected with whatever the anti-anesthetic got himself up and within um, a short while was up and about running with, um, with the team again. So guys, at eight o'clock, which is my, my cutoff time, <laughs> um, pretty much at the end of the presentation, but just wanted to say, you know, as a, as a way of finishing up that there's about two, two and a half, maybe three million people that live on the edge of the Kruger National Park. And that's not even the guys coming in from the Mozambique side. Unemployment rates that I've seen, that I would guess, you know, national statistics of youth unemployment is sitting close at 70%. You'd imagine youth unemployment in this, in these areas are 85, 90%. The park itself is struggling. You can imagine with COVID, the, the stat is a great article I posted on the US, um, WhatsApp group shows 66% loss of income in the park. So the guys are doing incredible work in managing this kind of uh, um, project. But the volunteer support that they get does make a massive difference. And in the good work, you know, that, that like for example, with the, the wild dog, there's all sorts of other things that are happening as well. Um, on the call, not too sure, is a guy called um, Cameron. 
who is working with the Ian Player Foundation. Um, I'm hoping to work with them to raise BEE money and other, and other funding initiatives to run education-based programs uh, alongside the park. I uh, just had a meeting yesterday with a school to, to drive leadership and study skills and marks and maths. This is really cool. So we're not just dealing with the symptoms of this problem. We're trying to be proactive to also put solutions in place. And of course, we're not the only organization. We're not the only guys. There's a lot of other people that I'm sort of meeting all over the place that is doing some amazing work. So once again, you know, with the, um, the same with Zanri and Tian, if anybody in the room wants to put some cash towards this SNEA project, reach out to me. I've um, I put a, po a Facebook post out recently and had five or six of my friends offering cash, which is great. Um, so yeah, if anybody knows, well, if anybody would like to, to help to make this more sustainable, reach out to me. <clears throat> more importantly, if anybody has access to a corporation that might be interested in sponsoring a project like this, reach out to me. If anybody has got an opportunity to get some PR out for these guys, they need it. Guys, these are champions. These are champions. And it would be awesome to have um, some extra support. And um, yeah, that is me for the evening. And I really hope it was an amazing, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you, that was, that was awesome. Let, let's, take a, let's take a couple of questions. We'll start with, um, is there anybody, anybody here in the live audience who wants to ask Chris anything? Question from Anneli? Um, the birds that are dying of avian flu, So the question is, do the birds that are dying of avian flu get predated by the pelicans? And the answer is, as far as I'm aware, no. First of all, the birds are quite big compared to the chicks, so they'll be a lot more difficult to, to swallow. They're often very desiccated or starting to, you know, if they're lying in water, they're tending to, um, you know, break up, of course. And no, we didn't see it at all. So I think they're live. I think they like their live <laughs> yummy babies. <laughs> Anyone else? Lewis, can you? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I've got a question. Another one. I was just wanted to say, I was very impressed with the electricity that you Yeah. Um, so the, the point was that there is like a gun that you can direct at the pelicans um, with like an audio or something, I would presume. Oh, okay. So very fine focused. Yeah, I guess that the oaks are looking at all of these things. I don't know where, I don't know what they're doing, but I know that there's been a huge amount of research that has gone into it. So, uh, and it's a very, very ineffective way of sending a team of oaks out every single week. Uh, at the moment, this is what seems to be what's working, but certainly let's hope that they figure out new ways of breaking the cycle. <laughs> yeah, besides shooting the birds, of course, which is like counterintuitive, right? Uh, we want to we want to make this all inclusive um, conservation, and just because the pelicans have adapted doesn't make them bad. They've just adapted. I mean, isn't that amazing? It's evolution in front of our eyes. You have yeah. So the question is, uh, do we have to pay? And the answer is no. Yeah. Damn, because it would be a great revenue spinner, <laughs> right? Um, but no, it's it's a volunteer it's a volunteer space. And obviously, we have to pay to get there. So for me, it was a flight down there. It's hiring a car. Uh, all our food we pay for ourselves. Uh, getting out there is free. So, um, but the talk is possibly renovating some of the buildings and making it into a, uh, um, a, genera a revenue generating space. So who knows where that'll go. Let's, um, thanks Chris. Let's take a couple of questions from the, the Zoom audience. Uh, Lewis, I don't know if there's anyone in the chat group that you can just read out a couple of questions. 
Okay, so well, Hendrik asked the question, which Graham answered, but because nobody uh, in the live audience heard it or saw it. So uh, Hendrik just asked, Chris, how many white breasted bank and reed cormorants did you see when you were there? And Graham answered it by saying, bank cormorants haven't been seen on Jackson since uh, 2019. There are no reed cormorants. Last year, you saw one bank's cormorant nesting on Malchas Island, with only two breeding birds. One of the two white breasted, but they don't nest on those islands. And then only a few nest cormorants. Just for that. Okay, so, so it's just for the guys here, the question was, are we seeing banks, cormorants, or reed cormorants? And basically the answer is no. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Graham. Uh, and uh, yeah, then uh, yeah, you were saying you couldn't work out uh, what the diagram on the rock was, and Lisa suggested that it was noughts and crosses. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. That was uh, one of the suggestions on the table. Um, it's kind of like... Yeah, it's a quick end of the game. If you've got to paint in on your first game, the noughts and the crosses, right? But maybe they figured out uh, <laughs> a way of uh, doing it again. But it was quite high up on the side of the hill. So you would imagine they would have figured out a way of doing it um, in a lot more sustainable way. <laughs> a lot easier way of playing the game, should we say. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't quite put rocks on there. So, yeah. Indeed, they would fall off. Indeed. <laughs> and yeah, maybe use some bird lime to glue them on. <laughs> <laughs> okay anybody else Lewis yeah, there weren't any other questions but um, <laughs> ask away everybody switch on your mics and ask away okay all right I think um, just from uh, from my side and I think everybody in the live audience really what a what a warm round of applause uh, Chris deserves I mean <laughs> a fantastic talk his enthusiasm is unbridled and quite infectious. <laughs> um, but uh, to use your own time to get involved with this, the volunteers and the names that you've mentioned, you, you really are doing sterling work. And, and despite some of the, the horrific pictures and stats, just the glimmer of hope that somebody is trying to make this a bit better and there are signs that, uh, that things will not necessarily return to what they were 100 years ago, but they are at least heading in the in the right direction. So, really, to everyone involved in it, and to Crispus sp specifically for Essa, I just want to say a big thank you, and what a wonderful talk that was. But Chris, there's. Uh, thank you. Can we, can we ask? Uh, maybe make the screen a bit bigger there. Can we ask everyone just to turn their cameras on for one second? I know it chows all your data, but I think it's worth it. Yes. And so we can see that you're all there. That's a great turnout. And, uh, and thanks for joining us, everyone. And uh, please come and join us at uh, one of our live talks next time. And uh, for those of you a million miles away, thanks for checking in as well. And uh, we're hoping for a great year. The last couple of years have been tough with various lockdowns and so on. And it's put a handbrake on some of our trips and things like that. But we've kept going. We've kept the talks going. And we've got great plans for the rest of the year. So please uh, look out for notices and we'll see you on one of them. Thanks, everyone. All turn right. off your uh, turn, unmute yourselves, and let's have a final round of applause. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Chris. Awesome. Ciao. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.